Sympathy is easy. You have sympathy for starving children swatting at flies on the late night commercials. Sympathy is easy because it comes from a position of power. Empathy is getting down on your knees, looking someone else in the eye, and realizing that you could be them and that all that separates you is luck. In politics, we have neither sympathy nor empathy for each other. We see only the other unaware of the fact that just a few things in our lives could be different and we could be them. So, in that spirit, today we're going to find the empathy for the other by understanding both left and right of politics in the United States. We're going to look at two different pieces of media, Yellowstone and the Batman, and see how they portray the political ideals of what is currently politically left and right. We're going to do this in a simple fashion, so we might not get every facet of these two sets of ideas, but we're going to do something today that most people have no idea how to do in modern America. We're going to check our assumptions and biases at the door and look at things as objectively as we can. If you can't do that, I'd recommend you click off now, because this video might make you a touch uncomfortable. But if you can, then hop on, friends. We're going for a ride. The first place I would like to start with is George Washington. Yes, our very first president. We need to look at George Washington's ideas on political parties. Way, way back in my youth, in U.S. history, this quote by good old George was the first thing that we learned. However, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reign of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. It's wise. It makes sense. And then we spent the rest of the year learning about how everything was run in the country by having to negotiate between the parties. So much for George's ideas, right? That said, let's look at some divided political parties. Let's take a look at this chart. Now keep in mind, this chart isn't exactly official, but it'll help get the point across. There's a lot of different political parties, movements, and ideas all along the spectrum. Some line up with one another, and some butt heads. Frankly, this isn't even the most cohesive chart of all the potential political and social movements that often inform a political party. And technically, even the media we're going to talk about today only falls in one section or another of this chart. It doesn't capture every facet and aspect of both parties currently in power in our democracy. In other words, both the left and the right are pulling from a variety of different historical and political movements as listed on this chart. Place this here before we even discuss the media to show the politics throughout time and history are very complicated. If you're interested in looking some of these up yourself, I've highlighted terms that the left and democratic populists are pulling ideas from in blue. The right and republican populist terms are in red. And I do make the distinction between the government and the populist that follows them because there are some distinct things happening between the two groups. If you really want to get freaky with it, in orange are some of the Russian ideas. I'll admit, I had to look up some of these as they are obscure, but the ones I was already aware of are interesting reads. And just to note, we're not covering all of this. I, and you, my dear viewer, would go mad. It's a lot and it gets dense. So as a quick overview, before we jump into the meat of this video, Yellowstone is sort of lodged between survivalism and individualist anarchism. But as I've highlighted, the Republican government does lean towards the Christian right as well as other movements. The Batman, on the other hand, has two different routes, which mirrors both the classic left and the progressive movement forming within the populace. On this chart, the Batman falls into the left anarchist mood. It's more about destroying everything in sight because of the corruption of the city. I'll explain more about this when we get there, because the Batman's explanation splits into two. But before we get to that, I'd like to take a moment to ask that if you like this kind of content, please like, subscribe, and comment below so I can keep going in the face of my crippling fear of being seen. Every little bit helps. The more views and subscribers I have, the more YouTube pushes me, which means I can make more videos. And I just wanted to say, your kind comments inspire me and make this journey for a shy, uncomfortable person a little bit easier. So thank you. Yellowstone is still so popular these days, and it's not surprising. It captures the heart and soul of America as a place of freedom. There is a reason why it's so popular. People want that kind of freedom. The openness of the Wild West, the joy of riding a horse across the plains. Who wouldn't want to capture a little piece of that heaven for oneself. Yellowstone follows the story of the Dutton family, seventh generation ranchers in Montana, fighting to keep their land from business interests and the native population. The Duttons have been on the Yellowstone ranch for decades, and they love feeling connected with the land living a simple, self-sufficient life through hard work and dedication. Hardship is their daily reality, but somehow they love it, finding meaning in struggle and the toil of keeping their land against encroaching modernity. Since 2018, we have been watching various versions of the family during their struggles across time. From the first Duttons in 1883 and that settle the land where their daughter dies, to the latest family that has just successfully stopped the largest investment company in the world from building on their land. We watch as these stories unfold in dramatic and exciting ways. Yellowstone pulls a great deal of ideas from transcendentalist thought, the first American artistic movement which was born of the land. Writers all talked about how wonderful it was to be in the land and of the land, and how complex systems of civilization diminish the human spirit, but nature is a kind of deity. In the same way, much of our modern Republican government doesn't much like the government. There is a sense that people should just be free to live on the land. Whatever happens may happen. And as Yellowstone shows us, that's not always for the best. Many of the problems that the people of Yellowstone face are a result of this freedom, the separation from the civilized world. They live in a kind of survivalist world. Man living with nature in many ways becomes a part of it, fighting for survival the same way the animals do. The 
freedom of living with the land hurts them. From losing a baby in their family, to losing their mother, it's not an easy life. But they seem to love it. They accept the dangers of almost total freedom. They don't believe in the safety of numbers or the trappings of the city. These scientists came up with after studying tribes in India and Africa. The smaller tribes didn't have any government, didn't need any. But when the number of people got up around 500, if there wasn't any government, the strongest people would take advantage of the weakest. Every time, without fail, they would enrich their lives at the expense of other people's lives. Government's men's way of trying to control our behavior, but it can't be controlled. Yet, in living this way, they also don't believe that they have value, that humans by virtue are evil, something that the transcendentalists did not necessarily believe. They are always striving to be better, to be good people and unselfish, but they struggle with it. And in their world, everyone is that way. Every Every year on the ranch is a tough one, and in the last season, they were talking about how the ranch barely makes enough to break even, and if something goes wrong, the business is vulnerable to outside forces like land developers. And then beyond just the struggle to live on the land, there is the struggle of holding on to the land. You can see that all over the main character Beth's face as the series progresses. Every member of the family has been shot at, blown up, assaulted, burned, abducted, you name it, but they don't stop fighting. And so there is no respect for law and order or systems of power and oppression. We are merely trying to civilize the wild parts of ourselves, and in the wild, wild west, that's not going to happen. Life is war. It's truly admirable, and it speaks to the firepower of the Republican Party. You may not agree with them, but you've got to give them some credit for that. And so, the legislation and actions of the party start to make sense. It is an absolute freedom that they seek. Nothing short of the ability to do exactly as one wishes and be able to cope with the consequences, whatever they may be. They don't see people as good, but as a blight on the beauty of the land and a tax on the resources. So, a large civilization that is sprawling and bureaucratic is antithetical to that freedom. Seeing some of us humans die out might not be the worst thing as far as some Republicans are concerned. But imagine if you grew up in the harsh world of the rural west or something else like it. Obviously Yellowstone is a drama, and nothing is as hard as that, but the drama helps to get the point across. This is also why taxes are antithetical to freedom. We cannot support each other. We must support ourselves, carve out what we can by being strong and capable, working hard to prove that we deserve a place on this beautiful, life-giving planet, because there isn't enough for everyone. And that hardship gives life meaning. Having the freedom to make mistakes and learn, that is everything. So laws that protect people from that aren't always seen as being good. How will anyone ever develop common sense, develop in internally without learning from experience. There is some wisdom to thinking like that on a small scale, but not on a large one. This is also what leads people on the right to rail against globalization. Large groups of humans, not great. Large interconnected groups of humans, even worse. In 15 minutes, you have a meeting with the Montana Trade Alliance. What's that? Their focus is enhancing trade between foreign nations. What does that have to do with me? It's politics, John. You know, you're gonna shake a lot of hands, you're gonna take a lot of photos. It amounts to absolutely nothing, but it does maintain the goodwill with the people that elect I'm not seeking goodwill. I'm seeking the end of the airport on my land. This new crop of isolationist Republicans see American interests as being against those of the world, especially because America is having some issues internally these days. It's not an illogical thought to only want to focus on one's internal issues during times of personal struggle. But our problems are the world's problems, and vice versa, no matter how you look at it these days. Ultimately, the vision of Yellowstone and much of the right is a small one. Of course, not everyone. We can't speak for every single person and politician in the Republican Party. I made that disclaimer already. Already. But there is a desire for a world that is smaller, more easy to manage, and one where people can be free without feeling like someone is watching them. But it's a hard world, often without safety, without ease, and deeply insecure. It's not one that values human life, because humans are seen as being evil and selfish, constantly striving for good. We must fight and work hard for all that we have. Again, we're not espousing anything here, we're just discussing what is. The logical conclusion of both Yellowstone and the Republican Party is not the world we have today. Their ideas are interesting maybe even noble in theory, but damaging in modern times. In the end, in their world, most of us would perish because there is no futuristic vision of the world, only preserving what is with minor changes, if any. There is a beauty to it, if nothing else. Of course, the setting of rural America is going to determine how some of this is interpreted. And remember, this doesn't cover all of the Republican Party, certainly not the religious right or those focused on business. The show itself is careful to be ambiguous in its politics. And with the character of Summer, an activist who ends up living on the ranch, there's even a respect for left-wing green anarchism. Frankly, the world of Yellowstone would be a really interesting one to live in, but but I'm just not sure that it fits practically with the world that we already have. The opposite of this world is Matt Reeves' version of the Batman, a darker interpretation of the Cape Crusader. Here we follow Batman into a Gotham City that is quite different from the Nolan version. It starts out as a murder mystery, with the Batman working with the police department to find the mayor's murderer, a serial killer known as the Riddler. It slowly devolves into a trip through an extremely corrupt city where even the good guys, like the Batman, are pretty messed up. 
The Batman captures the two sides of democratic thought in America today. The Batman acting as a stand-in for most of the democratic populace and most democratic politicians who are just doing their best to survive and do good in a broken world. And Selena Kyle, or the Catwoman, as the leftist, more pr progressive, younger democrat populace and some of the politicians on that side who represent a darker feeling in the face of that corruption. Those who try to do good but are aggressive, cynical, and not certain that the system can be reformed. And make no mistake, much like the city, the democratic party is very systematic. It's all gears and knobs, bureaucracy, somewhat paternalistic, organized, and focused. And again, the Batman doesn't capture all Democrats the same way that Yellowstone doesn't capture all Republicans. There are more isolationist and more globalist elements of the party, some are more interested in climate change and the environment, some are anti-capitalist, and some are only interested in civil rights. This places them in different parts of the spectrum on the chart that we discussed earlier. No one TV show or movie could fully capture every single idea that is influencing any political party at any given time, especially in a place like America, where there are so many different ideas constantly happening. Now that doesn't mean we can't learn something from the world of the Batman. Using the film, we can learn about Democrats and what is at the root of their philosophy right now. As Batman searches for the Riddler, he unravels a deeper conspiracy at the heart of everything, including his family and the death of his parents. In the same way, being a liberal in modern America means living through the unraveling of deeper and deeper conspiracies, not ones of lizard peoples and aliens, but of corruption, greed, and of American imperialism. As a Democrat, the populace faces the reality of America, not as a place of freedom or liberty anymore, but as a place with intense past karma and pain that it must confront. As Gotham decays under the weight of corruption, so too does America. And where are our heroes? The cops and lawyers are just as much a part of the corruption as the actual gangsters and the rogues gallery members. There is only madness in the streets as Riddler crashes a car into the mayor's funeral with the corrupt district attorney in it, wearing a collar time bomb. Luckily, they are able to evacuate the church, but the bomb is activated, and his death only deepens the conspiracy. Each day, it seems new information comes out about America's past mistakes or our current issues. Some politician, lawyer, or judge is corrupt in some new way. It's hard to live through. And though there isn't this level of corruption, happening in the country right now, there might as well be. But the Batman, like many Democrats, trods on. He's not perfect, and neither are they. He seeks vengeance, not justice, but he won't stop. He's driven by the desire to try and help as many as he can. In the end, we see his mad determination in this scene. He's not necessarily just doing it out of the goodness of his heart. He's trying to deal with his own issues in helping others. It doesn't mean he's a good guy. He's just doing his job. His legacy is complicated because his own family was caught up in the corruption that has been plaguing the city for decades. When the Riddler's identity is revealed, it is revealed that Bruce's father, Thomas Wayne, had a journalist killed. It turned out to be a misunderstanding, but it's one of those, if you're gonna ask a gangster like Falcone to threaten a journalist, the journalist is probably going to end up dead. Thomas was going to turn himself and Falcone into the police when he just happened to be killed. Coincidence? Of course not. Batman is steeped in the muck of the city, not a shiny example of who he should be, much like many politicians across the board today. We are more aware of the corruption of our system and the problems than ever before. Frankly, that's more of what being woke is in modern times than anything else. And it's hard not to be aware today, especially for young people. For Selena Kyle's character, and for young people on the left, it's challenging to believe in anything. She is revealed to be Falcone's daughter and a criminal in her own right. Struggling to make it in Gotham City, she works as a waitress in a nightclub and starts investigating when her roommate disappears, leading her down the same trail as Batman. Though her means are more complex, she's not trying to be solely good. She just wants to survive and help as many as she can, the same as Batman, but she's a lot less interested in the law, stealing where she can. She has had a complicated life, to say the least, and that makes sense. Young people who are more leftist these days struggle with moral purity given their circumstances. In a complicated world, they can't always do the best, most moral thing all of the time. This is the element of class warfare that we see among young people these days, a farther left politics leaking into the world of what we have known to be centrist in America. It's interesting because there are no good guys or bad guys, only people who want to find the truth and those who wish to conceal it. But no character is truly clean, morally speaking. Even the Riddler, who is out murdering people, is leaving clues for the Batman to find out why he's doing what he's doing. He's very much inspired by the Batman. In the end, he is captured and reveals that he has planted bombs to destroy the seawall around the city, flooding it and killing the mayor-elect. Batman saves her and vows to keep trying to save the city, but Selina gives up, deeming it beyond saving, and leaves. A lot of young people do feel this way, but it's more of a reference to how being realistic means that hope is hard to come by. Young people these days are not leaving the party because they can't, but they are pushing the needle further left to accommodate their needs. Everyone is fighting the same enemy, the corruption systems, and where Selina and the Riddler quit and give in, Batman keeps going. The logical conclusion of the Democratic Party right now is that it is going to take a ton of work to fix things, and that young people like Selina Kyle have have to find hope and keep trying in the face of hardship. We have to be there for each other. The Democratic Party has changed massively since the days of Obama because they have chosen to embrace younger folk. They're trying to find a balance between the ideas of the highly educated and leftist young folks who come from diverse and complex backgrounds and their historical base of older centrist liberals. So the party is in a place of rewriting itself, which makes finding a clear conclusion on the party's politics difficult. I wouldn't say that the Democratic Party's politics are very practical either. I can just say that they're a little bit more akin to the world that we're already living in. This chart that we started out with 
gives everyone a better idea of how complicated politics can be and how much ideas are informed by history, culture, education, and so much more. Obviously, these ideas are not going to explain every policy idea that has passed or every single bill that shows up in Congress for either party, but it shows us what their priorities are. The goal here was to show the ideas driving each party on a very broad level. To get more specific, we would have to analyze that chart and break the parties down into smaller groups. Many of these ideas are also unfortunately rooted in the locations of these stories as urban and rural, so they do affect what we can discuss here. But I hope that this can make you understand why your neighbors in another state or another town might feel the way that they feel, that Republicans want to be free, to experience life as their ancestors might have. They grew up in a different version of America, and if you watch the channel Recollection Road, the comments will often reflect this idea and the anger at the loss of that ideal. In the same way, Democrats often come from urban and suburban environments where people live close to each other. The desire to help as many people as possible runs deep. It gets easier to see the class warfare already happening when you walk through the city and see suffering. It's harder to be callous about it. Around other people, it's hard not to want to see the world get better for everyone. In the end, it's merely a different set of priorities, born often of a different set of circumstances. And that's the point of empathy, to recognize that in the case of a different set of circumstances, your viewpoint might have been the same as the guy you hate on TV. Thank you so much for watching. And again, if you like content like this, please consider subscribing. It really helps me out. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.